amazing lineup. So we're gonna bring out the one and only Miss D. Wallace. <laughs> Serena's role, and he was like, 
you're, you're not a mercy. Um, but we fell in love in the room, and I got a real education in power from Eli Roth, because I didn't know that much about the genre, and he just pumped me full of great references and really educated me in this world, and now I can hang out with all of you. First of all, Queens of Scream. That's so awesome. I was like, we should do a TikTok dance together and <laughs> raise our cringe factor from the whole table. <laughs> um, so, my first foray was Valentine. Sitting on a bath 
an apple box in a bath of cold water and like the prosthetics have frozen and it's just kind of like, um, and then you need to have the emotion. But then the added piece of like there being nudity in that, like. So vulnerable. You, yeah, you're so vulnerable. It was a lot of elements at once, uh, like sensory overload. <laughs> um, so uh, that was um, like a challenge to shoot and I feel like that scene is so iconic and I'm so grateful I got to bring it to life. But that, that scene is like a testament to it takes a village to make a movie. You know, the editors and the music and the sound and all of that. Um, obviously Eli's like touch on everything really made that scene come to life. But I've not heard on set, like recently I did a movie and I I was like had to run into a fake trip and but then I did it twice really well and on the third I really tripped. Oh. Like I hit my Yes, on something, and I had to go get a camera shoved down my throat, make sure I didn't like, you know, it's I'm still reeling from that very alive yeah, story. Yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of anxieties and claustrophobia and, um, uh, yeah, and just not being able to get air. That's gnarly. Uh, my most challenging role is a movie that I wish more people saw. I'm so proud of it. It's called Grace. Um, so if you haven't seen it, try to see it. Um, if I, I'm pregnant with a, sorry Jane, I'm pregnant with, um, sorry Serena, sorry Dean, <laughs> I'm sorry Marley. I, I'm not a mom, so this, is, this was a tough subject matter. Um, I, I'm pregnant with a baby and I get in a terrible car accident and I'm desperate to be a mother and I have to give birth to a dead baby and I will her back to life and she survives on my blood and it's like a really um, psychologically difficult place to be. Um, but it was also challenging because we had one baby and usually we get twins if you use babies, um, but we only had one and I had a prosthetic baby and a cat were my co-stars. So it was a lot of me pretending to have a baby on me. And anyway, it was a psychologically really challenging and it was a, a gnarly schedule shot on film in 20 days and um, it's something I'm really proud of. So I'm just selling it now because I, I wish more people could. The 
the hardest thing was the night shoots. I mean, my dog would get up when the alarm went off and walk into the wall. Seriously, we didn't know. And, and we were working six nights, and then we had a day off. So basically, you had no time off. Um, I had it in my contract that there would be no additional nudity added other than the big scene around the fire with thank you my fiance and the she wolf <laughs> and um, then i walked into the barn scene and there's three women with their boots hanging over the ledge <laughs> and i said what is this and joe said well the foreign distributors wanted more nudity i said yeah but i've got it in my contract that there's no more nudity I said, I'm not doing this. So they called Dan Platt, our wonderful producer, at 3 a.m. in the morning. He pulls up in his Porsche, screeches to a halt, gets out, slams the door, walks into the barn, takes one look, and goes, she's right, it's stupid. <laughs> walks back out, gets in his car, and drives on. love yourself and respect yourself enough to speak up for yourself when stuff isn't okay. Um, and because I play mothers all the time, <laughs> thank you, um, I felt very protective of all the kids that I worked with, especially Danny Pintaro, who was so amazing in that part. And um, in Cujo, off the island. But lots of the, the best shot that I think we got in the alley, we lost the generator, which means we had no lights. And we had to get this big shot of the uh, barn outside to set up the whole thing. We weren't coming back to that location. So you know what the DP did? He had everybody pull their car up, turn their headlights on, and that's how we lit that scene. And it's eerie and fabulous. Jane, I love Don't Breathe. It's such a magnificent film, and you are so great in it. Um, how did you approach working alongside Stephen Lang? I have a personal experience with him that was extremely scary. He's scary. <laughs> <laughs> I got lost at 6.35 driving him somewhere for something, and I thought I was going to die. <laughs> um, yeah, just talk a little bit about what You're it was like. scared of him in real life? Yes. He's not kind of scary. <laughs> Was a little scary when he was in like killer blind mode. 
Jane, I love you at ET, we let you cry every time of the year. Jane, Evil Dead, fantastic. Serena, I have loved you since Power Rangers Lost Galaxy. Jordan, love your death scene in Cabin Fever. Brilliant. And Marley, you were wonderful in Scream 2022. You're welcome. Thank you. I needed to know, when is Don't Breathe 3 coming out? Was it Dave Baker? Yeah. Um, hi, I wanted to ask, how do you really get to build your relationship with your directors and really like aligning with their visions and also just being able to like, when lightning strikes twice, um, especially you, Jay, going from you know, a thin 30-year-old concept of Evil Dead to the insanity that it is, don't breathe, you know, a blind veteran being like, as you know, more flopped in. Um, and it's, it's. Um, I always appreciate that collaborative effort. How do you put that faith into them and their selection of team members? That's a really good question. It's a really good question. Um, I have a specific relationship with actor and director. I'm sure you guys can speak to that. Um, I think that Fede and I just have really good creative chemistry, honestly. I think that he hired me because he saw something in me that he understood or that he... I don't know. I, I, it's, it's, um, I think it's chemistry. I mean, there was... Evil Dead was his first movie, and it was my second movie. And we did, you know, have to learn how to trust one another. Um, and we uh, thank you so much for all your support from the people that 13. I was like, okay, people like me up. They like this uh, movie. I mean, I feel like there was some hate when it first came out, but for some reason, it's like people love it, like grown for that movie, which is really cool. Um, and so after seeing your response to Evil Dead, I felt like, yeah, of course we should make another movie. And when we had dinner six weeks ago, he was like, and we should make it up. <laughs> really good question. Uh, it's a really fine line that an actor walks with the director. Um, and again, you have to go in knowing that you know your craft and that you know what you're doing. And the director needs to be able to communicate with you exactly what he wants so that you can take your talent and your instincts and bring his vision to life. I can tell you that every major director I've worked with, Peter Jackson, Steven Spielberg, Joe, no uh, deal. Louis. <laughs> I said no big deal. <laughs> um, they all have one thing in common is that when, first of all, they trust who they hire, and secondly, when the magic happens on a set that's not planned out and you don't expect, they get it and they run with it. Um, for example, on E.T. in the dinner scene, when he says, my husband's in Mexico with Sally. I felt the tears coming up and Mary had the thought, I can't let my kids see me cry. So I got up from the table. Not in the script. Stephen Cutton came over and he said, Dee, why did you leave the table? That wasn't in the script. And I told him what happened. And he stepped back and he looked at me 
And he turned to the crew and he said, you've got a half hour, I need you to build a kitchen wall with running water over there so he could take me over to the sink and bring me back into that close-up where I say he hates Mexico. And it all happened right there. Same thing with Peter Jackson. I mean, when the magic happens, you both know it. And you expand on that moment. And that's, that's the best situation you can have with a director. Talk about talent. You just literally made me cry. <laughs> Explaining that, that magic that was created. Um, and you're just such an incredible communicator. And thank you for, for sharing that story. So I've been learning things how to be, how to advocate for myself. Oh, yeah. yeah. You're, you're so generous to keep reminding, even though like, I'm a little broad now, but like I need those reminders from somebody that has worked with people like that and knows, thank you. Well, and ultimately they respect you more, and a director isn't an actor, guys. A lot of times they don't understand what drives you emotionally. And, but when they can see it and, and feel it, then it expands everybody. I mean, I've, I've seen uh, my DPs have an idea, and as soon as they see it, everybody goes, oh my God, that's amazing, yeah, you know? So, it, but the director, producer, whatever, has to give the people he hires the understanding that they have the room creatively to go there. You know, uh, so many of the young directors that I work for now, okay, well I've got a shot list, and I've got this, and this is what we're gonna do, and I need you to stand here on that line, and I go, I, I just had an experience like that, and go, with all due respect, I don't work that way. Yeah. <laughs> I have to find where I need to go. I have to find what the emotion is that's driving me over that corner, you know? And so it, everybody's different. You have to figure out who you're working with, but you have to give yourself that self-respect and knowing that you know that you know, you know? You know? <laughs> You mentioned uh, the Frighteners, and I was a little curious about that, because you worked with Peter Jackson when he was still not really, he was a Lord of the Rings Jackson, and no, a very against... No, creatures, Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. And a very against type character. You were crazy. <laughs> uh, yeah. So. Yeah, I had to go to New Zealand to get out of playing mothers. <laughs> but I was just curious what it was like to work with a up-and-comer with a very different character type. And a fabulous. Very oh. It was fabulous and wonderful. Peter, so giving as a director. I swear to God, he's like a hobbit himself. <laughs> you know, it was winter in New Zealand, and he comes to the set and flip flops, cut off, and a damn jacket with his hairy beard sitting. He was just wonderful and took all my ideas. Uh, there was one idea he shot down and he, we just didn't have time to do it. There just wasn't time. But he's an amazing director to work with and very, very giving and creative. All right, another question? Alright, so this kind of goes off of uh, Jane's comment earlier about the, uh, the audition so hard that you had to go back and apologize. <laughs> I feel like all the movies y'all are in, like, they have some really hard, like, sometimes in the movie, really, really hard takes and stuff like that. People come in with, like, a character that's, like, super memorable. That's, like, one of the best things about genre movies. So my curiosity is, 
So I guess I'll ask Jane first, because you gave me the idea for this question. It's really for anybody out there. Did you ever show up to a set with a character that you thought was like over the top and it worked and you're just like, oh man, that worked, that's, that's great. Or conversely, did you see somebody come in with something that was like, that's the thing, that is wild, I love that, you know? That's a great question. I, I need to think about that. Does anyone have an answer? Well, I, I would say that by the time you show up on set, you really have to know who your character is. You need to know, I mean, everybody works differently, but for me, like I have to know their whole entire life and what happened to them when they were five and 10 and 15 and all the drama, right? And so, um, so any aspiring actors out here or actors currently working, like you gotta show up on set prepared knowing your lines but like knowing who you are. And like as Dee said, like be like really strong and confident in that. So then when the director comes up and or, or you can get a new idea, working with other actors, right? It's not about you, right? It's about taking from your other actors and your environment around you. But if you're solid in the character that you've created, then everything else just like enriches that and then it does become something so much bigger than you ever thought of. Like, you, you had it in your head when you were at home working. Does that make sense? Yeah. It does. Okay. Yeah, I, I thought, oh, go ahead. Well, it's a little bit about you, um, <laughs> which is, it's kind of adjacent to what you're talking about, something and how to really, like, knowing this is, this is the take, this is the tone, and a lot of it is tone, like, you don't know what the tone is, so that would be very helpful if you knew that. But you think, I, I'm so this, I'm so it, and then Marley might get cast. It's happened. Serena, maybe Jane. I'm just saying. And then you see what it is, and you go, "That's perfect." I totally understand. Maybe my thing was cool, whatever. But that they're doing that thing that is so specific, and that is so how it needed to be played. And so it's often that friends of mine, contemporaries. People I'm just a fan of get something, and I go, oh, okay. And it's not a thing I I do or I brought or I can, but I it's right. And so I, it's kind of cool too when you're friends with somebody, and then it's not going to be you want it to be your friend. Yes. Well, it's but I think it's important. Cool. Sorry. Oh yeah, I was just going to say in regards to that, I think it's just as important to stick with your choice. Yeah. With what you your vision of, of what that your take on the role with you know, put your shoulder behind it in in that audition because if you don't if you kind of back off of that thinking you know wavering on oh what do they want what, what are they right. looking for then you're really screwed like because it's so arbitrary it could be your take was spot on totally or my take was but like right. but if you don't commit to it that's when you're kind of left in limbo but I I wanted to add um. When you said like that kind of showing up on set and like you're you either you, you make a choice or you do something and it's either well received or not or or someone else says something and it's over the top. I I think you guys will appreciate this. I got so hazed <laughs> on Scream Four on my first day. I um I showed up in Ann Arbor, Michigan when we were shooting and I was really jet lagged like. Coming from Europe, direct jet lag. I had could not sleep to save my life, and I had a nine-month-old baby, and I get to set, and it was the scene with Gail and I, where we're at the police station, and I'm, I'm locking the the door for letting her enter, <laughs> and we have that standoff, yeah. and my brain was so much that I also could not learn my mom like. The night before, I, I drilled those stupid lines like over and over, and I just, it was not going in the brain. Like, it was just, I just, my body was not cooperating. So I barely, barely say my lines. I'm exhausted. I'm a new girl in school. You, think, you know, these guys are like the cool kids, and they, they're all from Scream 1, and ah. And, um, and then I go, and I, <laughs> I go to craft service because, you know, the, the world of like film crews is pretty small and word gets around. And my husband's a filmmaker and he said, oh, you're 
love craft service on screen because they did my, a movie that we shot like two months ago and you have to order this crack lack of coffee, this iced coffee, I'm like, okay, let me get some coffee here that'll help me with the lines. So I like march over to craft service with my uniform on and I'm just like kind of grazing and gonna ask for some crack lack of coffee and they're like, um, we're sorry, um, but, but extra holding is over there. This is not your craft service. <laughs> I go and find a chair to sit down on and just in my dejected, you know, jet lag cell. And I sit, and not me, I sit on a folding chair on set, and it's covered in water. So I stand up, and it looks like I peed my pants. My entire ass is wet in that stupid uniform. So now I've got like, I look like I peed my pants. I, can't, I, can't, I have no brain. I'm, I'm an extra, and I've got to perform. And God bless, like somehow it got in my hard drive, and I, I it was all my might and sheer willpower. I like got those lines out, and it's one of my favorite scenes in that movie of, of what I got to do. Um, but I think it was from pure desperation. You know, it's just like I just have to get these lines out. Like I just have to do this and go home. So anyway, that was. That was my first day of school hazing in the screen franchise. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you guys all for being here. We really, really appreciate you coming uh, for us for Texas Frightmare. My question is for the whole panel. Uh, recently, Fangoria revisited an article that Barbara Crampton had written back in 2016 about her personal objection to the term screen queen. I wanted to know how each of you felt about that term. Is it something you embrace? Is it something that's to be reviled? Is it something that's just completely overused? Or is it just an easy term? I think it's so cool, and I think it's cool because horror fans are amazing. You guys are the best fans in the world. Being uh, like, accepted into the club by all of you is so, so wonderful. So I, I wear it thank you. And so it, like you guys have all said, it's a total honor. 